Life can be overwhelming, and it's easy to feel lost. It can be hard to see God working in your life, but he is. God is working to reveal his love and power. Supernatural, a new book from Dr. Bruce Becker, takes you through the powerful ways God stepped in to deliver his people throughout scripture. As you discover God's love through his actions, you'll see he will carry you through whatever you face as well. Now today, I, want to, I don't want to talk to you about the explicit bad things of the internet. Uh, pornography is a huge problem that's affected my life and many of yours. We're not going to talk about that today. The toxic trolls in the comments section, they deserve to be excommunicated from the internet. We're not going to talk about that today. There's fake news and algorithms and the obsessive comparisons as we scroll social media and look at all the numbers. That deserves a sermon, but that's not this sermon. Because this sermon, I want to talk about the more subtle things of your digital and spiritual lives. I just want to talk about maybe the quantity of the things you're putting on your plate through those screens and then ask some really serious questions about three areas of life that I think all of us care about. Our family, our friendships, and our faith. So if you want a roadmap for where this message is going, I want to cover three things. First, your family, then your friendships, then your faith. And ask the question, are these screens, are all this screen time, is it ended up being bad more bad than good, actually, for our souls. So today, if you came for a happy, clappy sermon where you skip out the aisle, you might want to leave now. <laughs> but this can be really good for us. If God needs to get our attention and, and like call us back to truth and reality, it's better now than tomorrow or next year. So I want you to grab your pens because we're going to wrestle with three big questions and think about the bad things that screens do to our souls. So, first of all, uh, let's talk about family. Uh, a number of years ago, I had a really memorable conversation with a pastor named Mark Jeske. Uh, if you're watching at home, you might know that name, the founding lead speaker of Time of Grace. And he and I were talking about ministry, we were talking about work and family balance, a lot of those big questions. And Mark Jeske said something to me that no one had ever said before. He said something to the effect of, you know, Mike, you think when you have kids that you have until they leave the house, but it actually happens long before that. You know, I just thought I'm raising my kids, time goes fast, and when they go off to college or when they get a job and get their own apartment, you know, I won't see them as much as I used to. But Mark Jeske said, actually, that's not true. Because they're going to get into high school and they're going to make their friends and they're going to want to hang out more with their friends than mom and dad and you're going to see a little bit less of them. And maybe at 15 or 16, they get their first job. And so for one or two or three family dinners a week, they're, they're not going to be at their place on the table. And maybe at 16, they get their driver's license. And so those minutes that you had with that good windshield time between parents and children, that's going to be gone. Maybe, Mark Jeske said, they meet a boy. And I said, what? No, no, for, forbid it. I'm going to keep my daughters in the basement so they're always safe. No, he said, you know, that's going to happen. The boy's going to be way more interesting than the old man who's dad. And he was just trying to convince me. You know, you think you're counting down the days and the months and the years until May of graduation, but, but that's not true. Like the window of your opportunity with those kids will close long before that. And that's why not long after that conversation, I made this. Uh, this is my daughter Brooklyn's graduation jar. So inside the lid, God willing, is the date of her graduation, May 30th, 2026. And inside are marbles representing one week until this moment comes. And I remember that conversation with Mark Jeske and, and creating this and going to Amazon and buying all the marbles. And I swear it was yesterday when that jar was up to here. You know the scary part, though? If Pastor Jeske was right, I don't have this long. I got half of these marbles left. My little girl was running around in her diapers yesterday. And now she just got her first job, opened her first bank account. It's about to start learning to drive. Like, how, how and when, how in the world did that happen? But it happened. And I say that 
not to make the moms and dads cry. I see some of you crying right now, my babies. But, but here's the fact. Every family member that you love has a jar. Like if your mom and dad are living, they have a jar. If you have a brother or sister that you're close to, they have a jar. If you have grandkids, nieces or nephews, sons or daughters, people in your family that you love, whether you realize it or not, every, every week you are one week closer to not having them in your life. And the mistake many of us make is what Mark Jeske was trying to teach. You know, you think you have until what the median age of 74, 76, 80 years old when they pass away, but actually in real life, most of the time you don't get that long. You know, mom or dad or grandma or grandpa gets older and they start to forget and they're a different person than they were in the past. Your brother, maybe you're super close to your brother, you, you would not believe this because he's your brother, but maybe he's going to meet a girl one day that likes him. <laughs> And she's going to want to spend time with him. And now your brother, who used to be there for every single Thanksgiving meal, he's going to be with his new girlfriend or his new wife. Maybe God gives him a son or twin daughters, and now you barely ever see him. And that relationship, even though he's still alive and you're alive, it's different before you want it to. And so here's the question you and I need to ask in our digital age. If that's true, if time flies with the people we love the most, are screens separating you from that limited time that you have? It's the first big question I want you to write down. Grab a pen. Are screens separating me from my family? Like I, I have this day, this week, this marvel. I don't have to be looking at something bad on the internet. The question is, will this lesser thing get in the way of the thing that on paper I say I love so much more? My, my kids, my spouse, my parents, my siblings. Here's what I mean. Let's say you're a teenager here today. You get dropped off for school or you, you drive there at 7 in the morning. You hang out with your friends. You go to class with your friends. You eat lunch with your friends. You go back to class with your friends. Maybe you're in an after-school thing, a sport, music with your friends. You drive home, maybe talking to your friends. And then you walk through the door and you sit down at the dinner table with your family. And what, what do many people do? Go back to their friends. Literally, just spent eight or ten hours with those people. You have this limited amount of time with the ones who gave you life. Will you separate yourself from the chance to really have a beautiful family which will last much, much longer than most of those friendships will? Let's say you're in a relationship or you're a parent and you go into work early with a fresh cup of coffee and you spend eight hours or nine hours or ten hours or twelve hours re returning texts, sending emails, meeting with people, closing deals, and then you finally, finally, finally get to come home to the ones that you love. And you're not ten minutes through the door when... Bzz, and it's back to work for the boss, the client, the partner, the coworker, And that little kid is... God gives us this limited time. Every parent knows it goes so fast. Will, will we allow these devices to separate us from those sweet moments when we can actually connect and be together? Dads, let me ask you a massively important spiritual question. One of the most important callings we will ever have in life is to disciple our children. Have you? Like, have you taught your own children, how to connect with their Father in heaven? Did they learn how to pray from you? Did they learn the, the Ten Commandments from you? Did they learn who Jesus is from you? And some of you would say, well, I, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, you look up YouTube videos to change like your oil and something on your car, but you won't use it to disciple your own children to know the living God. The, the screen time says that you have hours of expendable time each day, and yet you, you don't take care of your own children's souls. There's something grievously wrong about that. I think of relationships. Uh, it's been kind of a, a, a tough season for our church in relationships. I feel like they're fighting and and there's adultery, and they need counseling. And I get that. Relationships are hard, and they can be really, really beautiful. Like, when you're connected with that person that you love so dearly, there's, there's something profound about that. That's like Jesus and his church and their connection. But here's something you already know. 
great relationships take time. They can't live off fumes. It takes time to talk, to listen, to ask questions, to communicate, to work through differences. It takes time to plan romantic dates. It, it, it takes time to give a back rub, to just be there and enjoy each other's presence. My, but my fear is that most of us today default to watching the same screen instead of looking in each other's eyes. That after we finally get home after work, after the kids are finally in bed, the way that we connect is simply by being in the same space, maybe even on separate devices. And if that's true, and it is for so many of us, are we shocked that marriages are struggling? They need time, energy, and effort. Have we wasted it? Not in the darkest corners of the internet, but just the ones that take too much time and attention. Today, we're not asking, can I have a phone? Can there be a TV in the bedroom? Can my kids have social media? The question is, are these screens separating us from the limited time that God has given? Yeah, I think of that passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Corinthian church loved to say, well, well, where's the line? What's right? What's wrong? I have the right to do anything, is what they said. But the Apostle Paul asked them this question, or made the statement, I will not be mastered by anything. Yeah, that's a big question for you. Are you mastered by your phone? Do you really want to give more time to your parents, to your siblings, and, and yet you step back and at the end of a week, you've given hours and hours to, to lesser things and barely minutes to the most important things? And if that's true of you, and it is for many of us, then screens are not a blessing overall but a bad thing for our soul. It's not just our families. Let's talk about our friends. Uh, maybe it's just me, but I think friendship is one of God's greatest gifts. I think it is one of the most beautiful depictions of the gospel, and here's why. Uh, because when your parents made you, they didn't know what you were going to be like. And now they're stuck with you. <laughs> and your brother or sister, like, you're their family, so I, I guess you're family. But friends are different, right? We get to pick our friends. We can come, we can go. So the fact that your friend wants to be with you, come to the party, remember your birthday, share a cup of coffee, that is a, that's like God choosing you is to be with a friend. And to have a friend who actually knows so much about you, the good stuff and the bad stuff, and, and still shows up, that's amazing. To have a friend who loves you enough to be both tough and tender, to like pat you on the back when you need it, kick you in the pants when you need it. <laughs> to have a friend who can kind of read between your lines and know when there's like something in your heart that you're not coughing up just yet. They can read your expression, the nonverbals, and they can ask the questions that you really need them to ask. You and I will not have many friends like that in our lives. Maybe 10, maybe six, maybe three, maybe two. But the ones that we have are such a beautiful gift from God. When you two get to be together in the same place, to share a physical space, that is a wonderful blessing from above. So here's my question. Uh, in those moments, are screens scattering my friends? Here's this incredible gift from God, almost as good as, as family, maybe sometimes even better than family. And finally, 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 we get together. <laughs> the question is, are we checking the game are we checking Instagram? Are we watching some TikTok? Do our friends have to literally fight to get our attention even though they're looking right at our face? Have you ever heard of the seven-minute rule before? It's a, a theory of communication that basically says the most important conversations you will have will really start to happen at about seven minutes in. So here's what happens. You and I sit down for a cup of coffee and I say, how you doing? And you say, great. I've been watching soccer all week. And I say, I know, because you're a follower of Jesus, so you should be. And you're going to say, how am I doing? And we're going to make the small talk. We're going to talk about the weather. Like, wow, isn't it cold in winter in Wisconsin? Who would have thought? And we're going to talk about the little things and the kids or whatever, the politics. And then after about five, six minutes, there's going to be that moment where we run out of things to say. The small talk's over. And it's kind of awkward. And you... And then someone says something that matters. 
It's on the other side of that awkward silence that you come forward with something you really need help with. Or your friend tells you something she's never told you before. Like the deep stuff, the good stuff, the stuff of life normally doesn't happen the first second you see a friend. It, it takes a little bit. But you know what's happened in our digital age? We sit down for coffee. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Good. The weather these days, huh? Awkward silence. And we miss the moment. It's like our, our brains, they can't stand it. You get to a stoplight and you're watching it click down. 20 seconds for those people to walk across. I can find something in 20 seconds. You're standing in the line at the grocery store. My goodness, how could you stand for two minutes without? It's like we're, we're physically unable to handle all. It makes us so anxious that we just reach for this digital candy. And it's not that we're pulling up something bad or bullying people online. It's that we were so close to something so much better with our closest friends. And the internet took it from us. It, it scattered us. I don't want to add rules that the Bible doesn't have, but I just want to encourage you, if you're with a friend and your phones are both out on the table, do you realize what that conversation has become? It means every notification, everyone who has my phone number, everyone who can text me or send me an email, like it's like they're all standing right behind me and they're all close enough to do this. And even if I'm trying to ignore it, this is, this is, and you're thinking, I wonder who that is. And I'm thinking, I wonder who that is. And I'm trying to be engaged in this conversation, but I'm distracted. And if you have your phone out, guess what? The same thing is happening to you. And, and now we just can't give each other our full attention because we've allowed all of these people to interrupt the conversation. And this moment that God gave us together, it's, it's scattered. This is why the Apostle John valued just being face-to-face -face with his friends. In the book of 2 John chapter 1, uh, Jesus' friend writes these words. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink, the modern technology of his day. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. There was some level of joy that John knew it has to be face to face. If it's this disrupted conversation, that, that's good, but it's not great. And if I want my joy to reach maximum levels with my friends, then I need to visit you and I need to talk with you and I need to be face-to-face. -face. God is trying to sober some of us up today. You ever, you don't have to raise your hand for this one, you, you ever been at a party where everyone's drinking way too much and you're the only one who's sober? And you look around and think, all of my friends are idiots. <laughs> slurring their words. They don't know they're slurring. You can't walk in a straight line. Doesn't even know. It thinks he's being funny and he's just being super cringy. And you, you have to be sober to see it because if you're buzzing, you, you just won't see it. That... Have you ever been the sober one in a, a digital party? Where you just walk in and you see these people who love each other just lost. You see friends who finally find time to make it out to dinner and a minute can't go by without someone reaching for their device. They're drunk on bites and pixels and you're totally sober and you see it. The Bible says do not conform to the pattern of this world. I know that's what people do. I know you have to be available at all. You don't have to be. You can value what John valued and say, you know, sometimes I can't have paper and pen. I can't have phones and tablets. I need to be face to face so that my joy can be complete. Finally, let's talk about faith. According to Jesus, what gets you faith and gives you great faith is this book. Romans 10 verse 17 says, faith comes from hearing the message. Now, this book has the power to teach you about Jesus, convince you that Jesus is worthy to be worshiped, it can save you. It can remind you of the mercy and grace, the amazingness of Jesus who went to the cross for you. But there's also something you should know about this book that just by touching it, 
doesn't give you great faith. Just by skimming it, doesn't give you great faith. Just by you sitting here in a church where there is a Bible does not give you faith by osmosis. I've stood in my garage for many years. I'm still a terrible mechanic, all right? Just like being in a physical place doesn't give you the gift. So how, how do you get the gift of great faith? The answer is by fixing your thoughts on this book. The book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, says this. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Like, don't skim, don't scroll, don't quickly like and share. Instead, stop and stare. Psalm chapter 1 calls this meditating on the word of God. You're chewing on it, you're, you're thinking of it, you're contemplating the compassion of the cross. You're fixing your mind and your thoughts on the amazing forgiveness that is all yours when Jesus died for your sins. Thinking constantly, persistently, and deeply is the thing that too much screens will not allow you to do. Here's my last question for you today. Are screens sabotaging my faith? Are they robbing me of the thing that will get me closer to Jesus? Have you ever studied how your human brain works? So God wired us with this like, incredible system of chemicals that are released during different experiences. Have uh, you ever heard of the chemical dopamine before? It's like a feel-good chemical. It's, it's what's connected with like really powerful experiences. So when you experience something new, like see the ocean for the first time, when there's something novel, I didn't know a cat could do that. <laughs> you just watch it on YouTube. Or when there's something dangerous or arousing or exciting, mainly just new things, like dopamine is being released in your brain. It's super exciting. It's super interesting. That's why we itch for it. In fact, it's the main chemical involved in addiction. Right, so drugs are like specifically chemically engineered, so we release massive amounts of dopamine. It's so, so good. But you know what happens after the crash? You itch for more of it. That's why addiction is so hard to escape. You've actually tapped into the reward system of the brain and taught your brain, I can't even be like baseline okay because I know what it's like to experience this. And so you crash below it and, and you just get, just get caught in the cycle of addiction with diminishing returns. Guess what's on the internet? New, novel, exciting, angry, arousing, everything. It doesn't have to be illegal or immoral. A new email, a new text, a new post a new person who liked my picture, a new person who's interested in me, all that new, 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 isn't wrong, but do you know what it does to your brain? It, it makes real life, non-digital life, itchy. It's like, I, I just want something. You ever watched a movie these days? Like count how many seconds until the angle of the camera changes because our brains have been taught. Try watching an old movie, you'll see the difference. New, 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 new. I, I can't watch one angle for 15 seconds. That is so boring. My, my brain, has this happened to you? Even the new movies, they don't interest my brain enough anymore. I'm reaching for my phone and checking the new, like what? I am no longer entertained by entertainment? Hollywood makes a movie and I need two screens just to stay interested? Like that, that's a red flag. And how many of us can't relate? So here's the spiritual problem. After we've all been trained to need that level of dopamine release and stimulation, what happens when we try to pray? Or read an old book and think about the words? Or come to church? Even if you didn't check your phone while I've been preaching, are you physically able to listen for 30 minutes to one human talking? I shouldn't admit this, but do you know sometimes why bring out props? Because your brain would lose me if I didn't. <laughs> Has this ever happened to you where you know pastor gives you just a, a minute to pray and you literally can't pray a minute until your brain is... 
Back in the 1800s, during the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the average American would stand and listen to rhetoric for four to five hours. <laughs> hours. Now if that Instagram reel isn't under 60 seconds, too much time. So I gotta ask you, is it possible that has sabotaged your ability to worship, to listen to preaching about Jesus, to read the word of Jesus, and to talk to Jesus in prayer? This is my great fear. Not that all of you will end up as gaming addicts or porn addicts, but that all of us will be so addicted to the dopamine rush of new and novel that the old truths from this old book just won't excite you anymore. So I know what some of you are thinking. So inspiring, Pastor. This is, I'm glad I, glad I brought my friend today. This is wonderful. Yeah, the church, it's like, thanks for the guilt trip. We all feel terrible about ourselves. <laughs> and I think my answer to that reaction would be, you're welcome for the guilt trip. We've been taught that guilt is a bad thing. Guilt is a God-given system to help us realize when we're doing a bad thing. And so, if during this message, you've realized, you know what, I give more attention to my work emails than to my wife. I'm more interested in the new and the novel than the old and unchanging. That is a gift from God. Don't waste it. Don't run away from it. Don't wish it was just more positive and happy and clappy. Lean into this guilt so you have the motivation that you need to make a change. We never change until the pain of the status quo is too much. I, I want you to feel the pain of that today. We are living in an age that is not wise, it's foolish, and it is wasting our limited time. And that's why you've got to come back next week. Like you and I, the answer is not to become Amish and move to a place that doesn't have Wi-Fi. Okay, there are too many good things about having these devices, yet we need somehow to come up with boundaries and structure and accountability so we can get the bad things, or I should say avoid the bad things and get the blessings. So next week, I want to promise you, much more hopeful, much more exciting, super practical. We're going to talk about what wise people do in our digital age to have devices but not be controlled and used by them. I hope you can come back for that. But today, I don't want to leave you before my amen with just some practical tips. I want to leave you with some gospel hope. Like maybe you are realizing, I, I can't go back. I, those last years with grandma, I, I barely saw her. <laughs> and my kids, they're not little anymore. How much time did I squander? Well, what have I done to my brain, to my soul, to my faith? If, if that's you, I want to tell you a story an old, old story about a boy who chased the dopamine high. Uh, there was this kid, he was the younger brother, and he thought his older brother was totally lame. He didn't love being with him. And the father was nice and everything, but not super, super exciting. And so this young man decided that he was going to take off and find something that was exciting. And he did. He separated himself from his family. He sabotaged his own faith by seeking after sin, and he loved it for a little while. He chased after the dopamine rush and woo, he, he got it with the women and the substances and the friends and everything this world has to offer. He was up here until he crashed. And the high wore off and if you've ever gotten lost in a screen and come out of that, just felt empty, unproductive, guilty. And he realized that he needed what this world cannot offer him. He needed his family. He needed his father. So he makes this long walk back to his father. He needs to see his face, look him in the eye. And if you know this story that Jesus once told, you know what happens next? <laughs> the father, thank God, was not lost in a piece of ancient papyrus. He was looking for his kid. And that father saw his son with all the, the guilt and shame coming down the road. He took off to embrace him. He looked him in the eye. He saw the compassion and forgiveness in his face. His son was so lost, but now he was found. He was dead, separated from the family, but now he was alive again. You know that story? It's called the parable of the prodigal son, one of Jesus' most famous 
And it's a reminder that wherever you're at today, whatever sins you've committed, foolish years that you have wasted, when you come to Jesus, here's what he does. He puts all of your sins in a big Excel spreadsheet. He highlights them all. And he clicks. Delete. And he empties the garbage can. And he looks you in the eye and there's nothing but joy and acceptance in his eyes. So I don't know what bad things you've done on a screen. I don't know what regrets you have today, but I do know this. We can bring all of our bad to Jesus and he responds with the greatest blessing of all, the blessing of grace. Let's pray. Uh, Dear God, um, I wish I could go back I wish there was a big rewind button on life that I could put some marbles back in the jar and be a wiser person and parent and husband and pastor. Uh, but I can't, God, and, and we can't. So we're looking to you for all the forgiveness that we need and all the spiritual self-control that we so desperately lack. Um, without you, God, this world is going to swallow us up. So before we walk out of here with shame and guilt and too much regret, Help us to fix our thoughts on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we ask, God, that you would send your Holy Spirit, who can only produce the fruit of self-control in us, that we would find a way to be balanced in this really difficult time to live. Uh, God, there are billionaires who made their billions out of tapping into the systems of our brain. Uh, They are not the enemy, but they can be without our wisdom. And so we're asking you today through this series to guide us, to teach us, instruct us, so that we can walk out into this world, we can look people in the eye and tell them that you are the God of love. Help us to do that, God. We need you, so we're calling out to you. We're praying all these things today in Jesus' powerful name. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks, Pastor Mike, for reminding us of the dangers and pitfalls we easily fall into if we're not careful to create boundaries with our screens. This month, we have a special book from our friend and colleague, Dr. Bruce Becker. It's called Supernatural, God at Work and On Your Side. It talks about the amazing and powerful ways God stepped in to deliver his people. It's yours with your financial gift to Time of Grace. Visit us at timeofgrace.org, write to us, or call the number on the screen. Life can be overwhelming, and it's easy to feel lost. It can be hard to see God working in your life, but he is. God is working to reveal his love and power. Supernatural, a new book from Dr. Bruce Becker, takes you through the powerful ways God stepped in to deliver his people throughout scripture. As you discover God's love through his actions, you'll see he will carry you through whatever you face as well. Supernatural is our way of thanking you for your financial support to help share how God is always present and working in our lives. Request yours today by calling 800-661-3311, visit timeofgrace.org, or write us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53201. Do you ever wonder if you're saved? Or what saved even means? Or what God is like? Or what Jesus did? Some people are embarrassed to ask these really basic questions, but please don't be. They're the most important questions you could ever ask. And that's why I want to give you a brand new copy of this little book I wrote called The Basics. Uh, You can get your paper copy or your digital copy or your audio copy or your video version just by going to timeofgrace.org slash the basics. Time of Grace doesn't end here. Visit timeofgrace.org and explore encouraging resources or sign up for our daily email and have everything delivered right to your inbox. Like our Grace Moments devotions, Grace Talks devotional videos, blog, and podcasts. Follow us on social media where you'll find a supportive Christian community. Do you need prayer? Contact us and let us know what's on your heart. Thank you so much for your support. See you next week on Time of Grace.